So far, we've looked at a number of algorithms that have used distance metrics to compare points within a training set. And this, this new algorithm, stochastic neighbor embedding, it actually does the converse. It measures a similarity between uh, points in the training set. And the way that it measures similarity is by constructing a probability distribution. And specifically for a given point in the training set, what we do is we construct a measurement of the probability that any other point in the training set should be selected as a neighbor of this point. The basis of this probability distribution is a Gaussian distribution. So what this means is that for another point, if it is right next to or right on top of the point in question, then that has the highest similarity. And then as that point begins to move further and further away, that probability drops off. Once we've done this in the original space, then we can begin to work in the embedded space. And like the other algorithms that we've looked at, we get to select the positions of our samples within this uh, new ZI space. And the game that we play here is we try to position the new ZIs such that their probability distributions match the probability distributions in the original space. So let's look at some mathematics. All right, first let's talk about a probability distribution, in particular the Gaussian distribution. All right, as, as you know, in uh, scalar space, your Gaussian distribution has, has a shape that looks something like this. where this is the position of a sample. So let's call that xj. And in this particular case, the, the mean of our distribution is set to be right at a point in question xi. And normally, Gaussian distributions are symmetric. I apologize, this one is not. The likelihood of some xj given that we know what xi is and we know what the standard deviation is of this distribution. This is proportional to this equation here. So it's e to the negative or sigma i squared. OK, so, so it's uh, the difference between xi and xj, the magnitude of that squared, and then uh, uh, we have the negative of that and divided by the variance of our distribution. And that's all uh, the, the exponent is taken to that quantity. There, there's a, another constant term that lives out here. It's just a function of uh, sigma i. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, matter in this particular case. So this describes the, the general shape here. And, and so when xj sits, say, right here, then it has a very high likelihood. And we're going to end up assigning a, uh, a high similarity to this particular point. And for points that sit out over here, we're, we're sort of uh, assigning a moderate likelihood. And points that sit way out here, we assign essentially a, a zero likelihood. So this is the likelihood function in one dimension. In, we can also draw it in two dimensions. So here's our xi right there. And then there are a variety of candidate xj's. We'll set those out uh, around this uh, space here. And what the likelihood function is, is imagine taking this 1D function here and centering it at xi and then spinning it around uh, that the, the vertical axis, the axis that's coming out of the paper here. And so what that means is that we end up assigning a circle of points, uh, all the points along on this circle, they get one uh, likelihood. And as we move further and further away, through these concentric circles, we assign lower and lower likelihoods. And so we want to, in this algorithm, assign a smaller uh, similarity. All right, so let me be a little bit more precise then about what, what I mean by uh, now probability of selecting another sample. 
So what I'm going to do is just say P I J and the meaning of this is given I the probability of selecting another sample J from the training set in order to be its neighbor. And this quantity looks like this. So it's E to the minus uh, XI minus XJ squared, and there's a sigma I squared here. So that this is just the same term up here. And this is uh, divided by all uh, a set of factors, uh, one each for all the samples in the data set. So this is for any K that does not equal to I, and then it's the same quantity, E to the minus XI minus XK in this case, squared and then divided by sigma I squared. So, so by expressing things in, in this way, what this means is if we take a sum over all K, then P I K, the sum of P I K is equal to one. Now, you might have noticed that I have uh, written sigma here, and it's not a constant, it's a function of the sample. And uh, the idea here is that when we have lots of points that are very uh, near to each other, we will want to assign a small sigma i. And if the points are more distributed, in this case, we want a large uh, sigma i. And, th and this determination of what sigma i ought to be is actually something that's done by the algorithm itself. So this ends up getting selected. Sigma i gets selected by the algorithm so that each sample xi has essentially the same number of neighbors as, as one another. And then we end up with a hyperparameter And Hinton and Crew call this uh, perplexity. That controls this this average radius. What the recommendations are is that this hyperparameter sits somewhere between five and fifty, where uh, these are the larger neighborhoods. and these are smaller. So looking back at this distribution over here, that's one particular sigma. If I were to increase uh, sigma, then uh, what I would end up with, actually let me decrease sigma, what I would end up with is a distribution that would look more like this. except it's also symmetric. There we go, that's a little bit more symmetric. In the case of the green, what we would be doing is uh, selecting a smaller uh, neighborhood because we're assigning non-small likelihoods only to points, say, within this range here. Whereas the original distribution, we were assigning non-small likelihoods to a wider range. So that's the intuition behind these probabilities. Okay, so, so now we have this question of how do we get from Xi to Zi? And we're gonna define a, a probability distribution also in this Zi space, but instead of being a Gaussian, we're going to select a, a student T distribution. And the, the student T distribution Let's look at that shape here. So a, a Gaussian might, might look along these lines here. What a student T distribution does is it tends to uh, be narrower than the Gaussian, but then it has a much longer tail. So it tends to be, it tends to make more conservative kinds of uh, choices.
All right, so in this uh, Z space, we get to select the ZIs wherever we want them to be. And we're going to define a new probability and we'll call that QIJ. So this is within this new space, the probability for sample I of selecting sample J as a neighbor. And that looks like this ratio. And this is based again on the student T distribution. All right, so this has the same sort of form as the Gaussian form where we define PIJ. And again, it's the case that the sum of all the QIJs, uh, that's equal to one. And finally, the cost function that they define, and this starts to get into some pretty heavy mathematics on the probability side, but the cost function looks like this, so that you have a sense of what it looks like. It's called the kullback liebler divergence. And it is the double sum over the i's and j's times the log of pij and qij. And this particular form here, this actually should look familiar from our work with decision trees. We were computing uh, information and information gain. And what the algorithm does is that it wants to minimize uh, C. And specifically what we do is we select the positions for all of our points such that we do minimize that that c and you can kind of think of c as being a function of those choices of z this is actually implemented as a gradient search and we've we've talked a little bit about the about gradients um, let me just write it down and for those of you who uh, have experience with gradient search uh, this will be meaningful to you. What this essentially means is that if we want to increase C, it tells us how to change a particular ZI, so move ZI around, and it's equal to uh, this uh, sum here. So this turns out to be really easy uh, to compute, and uh, this, this tells us how to make a small incremental change in all of the positions of the Zs, and then we remeasure everything and, and do it again un until we reach a point where we're sitting at a minimum, where we're not changing the Z's anymore. All right, so that's the essence. Let me say a couple of other things about the algorithm before we move on. So first off, the, the use of the student T distribution as opposed to the Gaussian distribution is that with the Gaussian distribution, what the, the neighborhood points tend to do is want to really clump together. And, and the student T distribution tends to want to kind of push them apart. So those that are uh, most similar end up being right near each other and, and, and the others tend to get pushed out a, a little ways away. One of the other things that we get out of this type of a similarity measure is that we're, we're treating all of those near points uh, as being important, but points that are nominally far away versus points that are really far away, we're treating them with, with equal weight. They don't really influence what our choice is for ZI uh, once it has settled out to the, the correct position. The use of these probability distributions, the Gaussian distribution and the T distribution, they do tend to emphasize clusters of points. So, so rather than getting one dimensional manifolds or two or three dimensional manifolds, they tend to want to bring the points together, so they're really zero-dimensional manifolds is one way to think about those. The perplexity hyperparameter, uh, remember that higher values there, what they tend to do is include more points in the neighborhood computation. So this is going to end up giving us a, a smoother type of clustering. After we've applied the learning algorithm to a training set, there really isn't a good way to come back 
later with a new query point and ask where it belongs in the space. And one can kind of hack it to, to get an estimate of where it goes, but there really isn't a clean way to, to do that. So this is this particular analysis is really about uh, after the fact uh, analysis of what's going on rather than using this particular algorithm uh, for other things, for say pre-processing of another data set. So in particular, we're gonna see this used a lot for visualization purposes. All right, so that's the essence of TSNE. And uh, now it's time to uh, try a little bit of Python code.